Well, welcome to the show, Bruce. We're so excited to chat with you today about life in the transitions. And I, Johnny and I both thoroughly enjoyed it. And we want to first start by talking a little bit about how this book came together, because I know it was an immense amount of work on your part with interviews to really define this toolkit. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me. It was great to be with you guys. I've been looking forward to this conversation. You know, this is one of those stories that, that on the one hand, feels like it's been changed by the ending, like that the, this book came out in the middle of the pandemic at this moment when the entire planet is in a life quake. Uh, but it didn't really begin that way. And so I, I sort of got interested, since you asked how it began, I'll tell that story because it, I got interested in life quakes, what I call now life quakes, because I went through one uh, myself, right? And I think back on my life now I think of it as having a kind of traditional linear path. I grew up in Savannah, Georgia. I left the South and I went Northeast to go to college. And then I left there and, and I found I learned more about myself as a Southerner by leaving the South and going North. And this was, I'm older than you guys, but this was the age of discount airfare in the eighties. And I thought, well, you know, I should leave America and find out what it means to be an American. So I went to Japan. I landed the day that the space shuttle Challenger exploded actually. Uh, and I started writing these letters home on crinkly airmail paper. Again, this would be totally alien to you guys, but they didn't have lines like, and the pad would have a line, like the cover of the pad had a line and you would stick it under the paper so that the writing didn't go crooked. You know, we learned to handwrite, right? There was no internet. There was no email, none of this stuff happened. And so I wrote these letters home for months and months and months. And when I got back home, everyone said, I loved your letters. I was like, great, have we met? And it turned out that my grandmother had Xeroxed them and passed them around and they sort of went viral in a old fashioned sense of the word. And I thought, well, I should write a book about this. I mean, it didn't happen, but I sold my first book 31 years ago this month. I was 24 at the time. And I spent my twenties traveling around the world and writing, this was kind of my thing. I would enter a world and write about it. So I wrote about Japan and England. I spent a year as a circus clown, as you know, and living in Nashville, writing about country music when I thought, okay, I'm a writer now. I can't deny this anymore, but I don't know anything about the Bible, right? Because in Nashville, all the songs were you know, kind of about that in one way or the other. And so I took Bible by my, off my shelf and I put it by my bed where it's not untouched for two years. And I went to see a friend in Jerusalem and my friend said, over there is this controversial neighborhood and over there's the rock where Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac. So I thought, well, here's an idea. Like, what if I walk along the route and read the story along the way? No one thought this was a good idea, like terrorism. And, you know, they were, this was the middle of all of those Middle Eastern wars, but I did it anyway. And I wrote a book called Walk in the Bible and it became a thing. And it went viral in the modern sense of the word. And so this is what I was doing in my 30s. I was going back and forth to the Middle East, writing books, making television. I got married, I had children. That's the linear path I was saying earlier, like you do something and then it, it hockey sticks, right? And then it was succeeding and this was gonna be my life. And then boom, then I had this life quake. And what I've now come to see, like a lot of life quakes, it was one, it was like a pileup. It was like a bunch of things happening at once. First, I got cancer at 43 as a new dad, uh, then, that was the last recession. I almost went bankrupt. My family owned real estate that all went under. And then my dad has Parkinson's and he tries to take his own life six times in 12 weeks. And this was just you know, an awful experience as you might imagine, even telling it now is awful. But I start, I'm the story guy and I'm the meaning guy. And I say to my dad, like, well, I'm gonna start sending you a question. So every Monday morning for what became years, I would send him a question about his life. Tell me about the toys you played with, the house you grew up with, how'd you join the Navy, how'd you meet mom? And he like dictates this answer to Siri and every week, and it's like the only thing really that he cared about. And I thought, well, this is really interesting. And when I told other people about this, everybody had a story that was like this about how they just got walloped by life, right? They're, my wife has a headache, goes into the hospital and dies. My brother gets diagnosed with stage four, this, that, or the other thing. I just lost my legs in an accident. My boss has stolen money from me, whatever it was. And what everybody was saying was kind of some version of the same thing. Like the life I'm living is not the life I expected. Like I'm living life out of order. And it was that idea that there is an order and then there's not an order like that was, the, that was the motivating thing. And so I thought I have to do something about this. And then what I did 
you know, to kind of wrap this up was like went out and started collecting what became hundreds and hundreds of life stories of Americans in all ages, all walks of life, all 50 states, trying to sort of answer this question of what do you do when something unexpected happens to you? This idea that we all have that life is linear and we latch onto this. And I think a lot of times it, it leaves us unable to face the transitions that you eloquently put in the book, we all are going to face in our lives. Why do you think there's this misconception around linearity to our lives? So this was the key moment, guys, in the whole process. And the best way for me to describe it was I feel like one day I pulled the book off a shelf and instead of the book coming off, the whole shelf opened. You know, that kind of fantasy that we have almost like a Harry Potter movie or something like, wait a minute, there's a whole nother room behind this. Apparently, Dan Brown has one of these moving bookshelves in his castle in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in France. And this is what was in the other room, kind of that was news to me. And now that we know that the book's come out and found this big audience, turns out to be news to a lot of people. And that is the linear life that we're talking about, that's an aberration, right? So that basically how cultures have a way of looking at the world and how they look at the world defines how we look at our lives. And so that in the ancient world, they don't have linear time. Right, they have watches and, you know, and batteries and all those kinds of things, electricity. So they think that life is a cycle, okay? To every season, turn, turn, turn. The Bible sort of introduces the idea of linear time. This comes along, uh, you know, with Western civilization. So the Middle Ages, they think, and you, you know, I have these pictures in the book that were so amazing. They think that life is peaks at middle age, and then it's downhill. Like, and everybody has to follow it: men, women, old, young. So it's like basic things like new love at 40 or right you know moving at 50 or retiring at 60 and opening a bnb all of those things were not deemed possible so that's a staircase life these paradigmatic shapes and essentially when science comes along the birth of science 100 years ago which brings of course the industrial revolution all these things suddenly everything is linear and why is it linear actually for no more profound reason than like Ford and because of the conveyor belt and because factories, things were done in a linear way. So everybody's, so Freud, there are Piaget, there are development stages for children, Freud, psychosexual stages, Erickson, the eight stages of moral development. Erickson says he models his on the conveyor belt, right? The five stages of Greek, the hero's uh, grief, the hero's journey, these were all these linear constructs and this reaches its peak in, you know, what for you guys will be ancient history, but the 1970s, Gail Sheehy writes this book called Passages, which says everyone does the same thing in their 20s, the same thing in their 30s, and then everyone has a midlife crisis at 39 and a half. And you, you can't overestimate how powerful that idea was. That book sold 20 million copies. And it, it sort of suddenly, it was law that you had to have a midlife crisis. So now let's just, again, let's just take the proof text of the pandemic. If you're between 39 and 44, you're having a midlife crisis. But if you're 27, you're also having a crisis. And if you're 67, or like my children, 15 and a half. So the point is that these tumultuous episodes in our life have nothing to do with birthdays that end in zero, have nothing to do with this linear. They happen when some people are born. I mean, if I spent the next 10 minutes asking you questions instead of the other way around, I would find out that, you know, one of you may have had you know, maybe one of, maybe your parents, one of your parents was divorced. That, that would be mathematically possible. Maybe someone has a drinking problem. Maybe someone lost a job and you had to move. Like, you know, maybe you lost a parent, right? Maybe you lost a job. Maybe you left a job to then start a podcast. So these are events of some voluntary, some involuntary that happen. I, that's why I call it the whenever life crisis because they happen just whenever. And uh, sometimes along with other people, we're all going through one together now, but often separate. And the point is they come more often. So the kind of the big idea of this book is we're gonna have one every 12 to 18 months, one of these disruptors. And most of them we get through, but one in 10 will be, will be bigger, higher on the Richter scale of consequences. That's why I call it a life quake. And that takes many years to get through. And the way you get through it is um, the tools, the steps, the phases of a life transition that becomes the backbone of this book. There's a lot to unpack there, so I, I, I'm going to just go ahead and start asking let's some go, questions Let's, let's here. go through the dirty laundry. <laughs> um, well, one of the things that stuck out to me was this, this need or want or desire to see the world, to figure out who you were. 
And that is just not something that I see that is prevalent in American culture. So were you a reader that was it, was it some, what sparked you at a young age that forced you out in the world? Because you see that in Europe, in Europe, it is encouraged to go to different countries and travel, take time off of school, but not in America. And so I, that was first one thing that stuck out to me, but also it is, it is that idea of traveling, seeing the world, finding out who you are, that is going to put together all of these pieces that become tools about how you deal with life quakes. So what was it at an early age that forced you out to see the world in that manner? So it's such an interesting question. And I've spent a lot of, and in, in, in a lot of ways, I'm not the right person to answer that um, because it's my life. But um, since you asked me, uh, I think a couple of things happened for me. Um, number one, uh, I grew up in a very, I'm very place oriented. So I grew up in Savannah, Georgia. I don't know if you've been to Beautiful. Savannah. You certainly have seen yes. movies made in Savannah. Um, you know, Savannah is a 80% of the buildings. Savannah was, was preserved by when, um, when Sherman burned Atlanta and marched to the sea. Uh, the Savannahans actually fled. This is not a story they like to tell, but uh, so therefore Savannah was not burned. And, the, and then a century later, the historic preservation movement began in Savannah. So like 80% of the buildings standing in 1800 are still standing today. And so it's very steeped. It was very isolating. It was very steeped in place and culture and history and a kind of bit of kind of self-mythologizing romance, of course. Um, but so I'm very place oriented. And um, cut to, as I said earlier, I grew up in the age of discount airfare where certain, where suddenly travel was possible. And so since I actually like to learn from place first, so to speak, um, I, uh, I like the idea of going to places as a way to learn. That's B1. B2 is I grew up Jewish in the South. Okay. So you know, I love the South. I love the stickiness. I love the storytellingness, the familyness. But I grew up Jewish in the South, which meant I was sort of a part of it, part of it, but apart from it at the same time. I also like being Jewish, right? And I like the familyness and the stickiness and the storytellingness. But I grew up Jewish in the South, which is not only different from the history of Judaism, but also from the history of Judaism in America. So I feel a part of it and apart from it. So I think of myself as kind of two things. Um, one is I'm an experientialist. So I like to go places and experience things, becoming a part of it. But I'm also an explainaholic, uh, which is actually an Isaac Asimov phrase for himself long before being um, whatever the, what, what, what a mansplaining has now been a bad thing. But I'm an explainaholic. So I like going to a place and then coming back and explaining it. So like I'm in Japan, I write these letters, like that's kind of fundamentally who I am. And then because I like I like um, made up words about myself, I have become a life historian. And so I think that what, what is appealing to me about the life storing thing was that I like talking to people, right? And so I, what I think about this book is like, in some ways I did the most old fashioned thing imaginable. I went and talked to people. Like Stud Strickle was doing this in the seventies, but I also did it in a newfangled way, which is then I did this data analytics. So then I had a thousand hours of interviews and 6,000 pages of transcripts. And so with this team of people, we spent a year coding it, trying to um, tease out themes and patterns and takeaways. So again, that's really me in a nutshell, like a foot in the, old, in the ancient world or a foot in the old fashion and a foot in the contemporary. That really, I think that really captures me pretty well. It, yeah, that sets up a lot of nice things. I, and I, I wanted to also add, we were talking about how a lot of people, we would view life as this linear uh, way. And then you had brought up a bunch of, of points that you felt contributed to why we think in that way. And I think one of the things that was missing there was um, where civilization got to a point where everyone was able to collect wealth. And so when you're collecting wealth, you just want to keep stacking it, right? It just keeps getting high. So once again, we're looking at something that inevitably just continues to grow. Life isn't like that. And because we're, we're going to be faced with trauma and loss, that's just the natural part of it. 
And of course, when you're collecting wealth, no one wants to see that go away. You want to just keep collecting it. So I think that lends itself to a, a skewed look at, at life. Now, um, the one of the quotes in your book that we absolutely loved, and it's about your default reaction to crisis. And when in turmoil, turn to narrative. And being a, a life story. Oh my course, God, read the next line. The next line is the killer. <laughs> read the next line. That's the killer line. Well, let's read it all, the, the full thing then. When in turmoil, turn the narrative. The proper response to a setback is a story. There's your line. There's the money line. Well, as you you see now why I asked that question about leaving and discovering and because that helps build narrative. It helps of who you are and all that discovery lends itself to building these tools of being a life historian to, to understanding how narrative works and, and also as a writer. So that's why I wanted to set the stage with that. Okay. Now I'm going to, I get to do the, um, you, you hang tight there, AJ, because now I get to do the unpacking. Okay. Cause I have a lot of things to say about that. First of all, yeah. I love, I'm loving this conversation, but let me go back to the first thing you said and we'll work our way to the story. Part. Um, cause you brought up this issue of what happens because a central myth, I would say of the American dream itself, a myth, but a central myth of the American dream has been that every generation is going to do better than it, than it's sure. Um, Absolutely. Than, than the prior generation, by the way, the idea of the American dream is not that old of an idea. It's only a century old. It itself was a product of the, of the linear age, uh, which is now past. Um, and so I do think that there is an interesting dimension here, which is that, you know, it is often said that, say, the millennial generation is going to be the first generation that cannot naturally expect to make more money than its parents' generation which was, would be presumably in this model, um, the baby boomer generation with the Xers uh, in between. But, I, and I, but this is very interesting to me. And it's interesting to me uh, it, a lot because of actually what I'm doing right now, which is that you know, Life is in the Transitions has you know, come out into the world. It's a top 10 New York Times bestseller. It's had a huge reaction. And I've actually now agreed to keep going and to set out and collect more stories and with the new stories I'm going to collect, I'm going to focus on people's work lives and their family lives and kind of how they navigate the major kind of work, family, hobby, creativity decisions in their lives. And by the way, if anybody listening has an interesting work, work life, please send me an email, brucefollow.com, and let me uh, consider adding you to this project. So I've been reading a lot about this issue of economics. And I think that there's other, you know, the, the, the way you said it was you left out something, I think even in the thing that you say I left out, there's even more <laughs> that you left out, which I've been thinking about a lot. So let's just put this all on the table, which yeah. is that the basic relationship between people and work, particularly large corporations and companies has been, has melted away, right? So the idea that you can have a long linear relationship with an organization, a company, oh. a corporation has been obliterated. Um, and kind of blown to smithereens in the last generation. And as a result, um, uh, that was something that was pretty powerful 100 years ago when the Industrial Revolution first rose, and even in the 1950s. Um, and so, but it's gone away now. You want to add something to this? Uh, well, well, AJ and I both grew up in factory households where our dads had bought into that idea only right. for us to see as teenagers that idea that and, and that just get yeah obliterated and it was all around us he grew up in detroit uh i grew up in pittsburgh and so two of the in, you know two of the muscular shoulders of the american dream <laughs> absolutely so we were there when it was crashing ar around us and watching our fathers deal with that very life quake i, I alluded to this earlier like what i said if it took if 10 minutes in this conversation we're going to start hearing you're not nonlinear event. So a lot of this idea of nonlinearity has to do with when was the, when was your first nonlinear event? Okay. So, you know, for me, I would say my first nonlinear event you know, was in my forties and for you, it was in your teenagers. And I think that that is increasingly, now we have fire trucks. That was, in, that was increasingly, um, I don't think they're stopping on this block, but there's a, there's, this is like a you know, two alarm fire. Serious business. Like. Yeah. Um, 
Sounds like Brooklyn. Yeah, it's Brooklyn. You know, this is this is life. Someone's having a nonlinear event. Every week, sadly. I <laughs> yeah, hope that, I hope that they're okay. Um, so we'll we'll keep talking. Um, Xers get this idea of nonlinearity more intuitively than do Boomers, and Millennials more intuitively than Xers, and that's a very powerful change that's going on in the culture. So that um, I feel like you know, remember, I was born in 1964. Okay, so that's normally the last year of the baby boom, even though that was 20 years after the war. But I feel like people 50 plus are still haunted by the ghost of linearity. So I think that for your generation, it sounds like for you individually, you already didn't have that. So you're already more insecure, on the one hand, more open to change. But, you know, people react differently. Some people react to that kind of instability by saying, I want a job and I want, want you know, I want to go into the most stable thing. I want to go into, I don't know, medicine or academia or something that's stable because I don't want to happen to me. There's a bunch of stories in my book, that, that story of Jamie Levine and about chapter four, who, you know, he grew up in, in Worcester, Mass., right, which is the shoe capital of the world and also kind of a blue collar shouldery town like Detroit and Pittsburgh. And his father also lost his job. And he's like, I'm never going to have this. And he b- rose to become a partner at Goldman Sachs, you, which you would think would be captain of the universe. And then his daughter is basically born without a kidney. And, you know, it, his life cr- comes crumbling down in his marriage and everything has to be rebuilt and reimagined. But, but he was determined not to have the financial uh, insecurity uh, that he saw his dad suffered through. So I think that that is an important thing that I think then gets us toward the second part of your question, which is how do we construct our identity given these nonlinear events, okay? And so what I wanna say is that your impulse to tell in this conversation that this happened to me when I was a teenager and this happens to AJ when I'm a teenager, that imp- what that is a way into is to understand that we all have this story that's kind of going along at all times in the back of our heads. The story of where we came from and where we're going and what's important to us, right? If, if, if that fire truck that just passed us here was going downstairs in my house or, not, or I had to then get a call and rush and go see someone in the hospital that I love, you're going to be telling a story about that person, like who, who are they? How do they mean to this? What, what do they mean to you? Okay, I was just watching this meme on the internet of Mr. Rogers when he won a Lifetime uh, Emmy Award, saying, "Spend ten seconds thinking about the most someone who sacrificed in order to get you where you are." It's not hard for anybody listening to us to take a second and conjure up somebody, a teacher, a parent, a counselor, a coach, a religious leader, you know, a, a neighbor who affected them. That is the story of who you are. And we know now that that story is not just part of you. That story is you in a fundamental way. Like life is the story that you tell yourself. And what we're talking about in this conversation is what happens when that story gets disrupted or interrupted or blown up in some way. And that is a breach. Okay. You know, a story fundamentally has to have a breach in the normal. Otherwise, there's no reason to tell the story. Everybody goes off every day and lives their life. And let's just say you have a loved one, a partner, a friend, a parent, or, you know, a, a spouse. You come at the end of the day, you don't narrate all eight hours of what happened <laughs> in the intervening time since you saw them. You pick the highlights. And the highlights are usually when, when something abnormal happens. Something good may have happened. Something bad may have happened. You may have gotten, you know, you may have won the lottery. You may have had a flat tire. You're going to talk about the breaches in the normal. And what the story does is it helps repair the breach. And so it turns out, though I wasn't aware of it at the time, that turns out to be a kind of a big backbone of contemporary psychology. And what this book about it, the book is about in a fundamental way, is what are the tools that allows each of us to repair a breach in our narrative? Because guess what? The breaches, or as I like to call them, the wolves and their fairy tales, the breaches, the wolves, the ogres, the downsizing, the tornadoes, the pandemics, they're coming at us at a much faster pace. If they did um, when, you're, when your parents just lost their jobs or you know, I was growing up even two decades before that. Yeah, that, that was really my next question, especially thinking about the research for the, the next book is, are you seeing an acceleration 
in the, the frequency of these transitions for future generations. So, you know, when I think about my grandparents, I think about them really, you know, surviving the depression and then and retiring at the company that they really started with. And then I think about my father's experience and bouncing between jobs because the factories did close and they weren't making Stroh's beer in the U.S. any longer and all these things. And now when I, I'm spending time with my fiance's sister, who's a generation younger than me, and I'm seeing all of the transition that she's going through and the disruption that she's facing. And I can't help but think it seems to me like the number of transitions we're going through as a society is increasing in our lifetime. And it's certainly not what we were taught by our grandparents. Our parents pass a little bit down, but it certainly feels like the disruption has become more of a norm than ever before. Yes. Okay. Next question. No, I think that that's, um, that's exactly right. So that, why is this? Okay. Yeah, so that there's was a whole my bunch next of question. I have yeah, a, so, a guess. You know, well, let's just start with the why, and then we'll deal with the how, right? So the why, if you go back 100 years ago, okay, and we're having this conversation, obviously not by Zoom and all these kind of <laughs> things, but we're having this conversation 100 years ago. But, but go, back, go back at that time, most people had to live where their parents wanted them to live, right? believe what their parents wanted them to believe, do what their parents wanted them to do, you know, maybe even marry who their parents wanted them to marry. Like most of our sources of meaning and identity uh, and uh, you know, everything else were given to us. You know? And if that was true for men, which it was, it was even more true for women, and it was even more true for the children that those men and those women raised, okay? Now, none of that is true. We can live where we want to live. We can believe what we want to believe. We can do what we want to do. You know, we can change our minds. We can change our religions. We can change our, even in the last 10 years, we can change our bodies. We can change our sexual identity. We can change our sexual orientation, or we can right size it if you prefer uh, that kind of language. We can change all of these things. And that is a blessing in many, many ways, but it's also a burden in almost every way because we constantly, nothing is fixed. We are constantly in a state of, do I want to be with this person? Because I can not leave. I mean, you just mentioned, I think you mentioned a fiance. Well, you know, you're not even married, but you can leave that person, right? You know, maybe you don't want to have, maybe you want to have a more fluid sexual identity. Maybe you want to change your jobs, or maybe you want to keep your job and then have a side hustle on the side where you do something else. Or maybe you have a hope job where you are, you know, writing a novel or uh, you're in LA, a screenplay uh, on, the, on the side, because that's your, your fantasy. You, at any given moment, are you a believer or not a believer? If you're a believer, do you want to go to a religious institution? If, you, if it's one religious institution, do you want to change that institution? How often do you want to go? That is a huge, 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 it's not a tsunami of change because it's coming at you from all directions. And even if you're somebody for whom something is stable, like maybe you've been in a stable relationship, or maybe you've been in a stable job, or maybe you've been in a sta stable sexual identity, or maybe you're cisgender and not in the position of transitioning your gender. Even if you're stable in one thing or two things, you're gonna be unstable in one thing or two things, okay? And then that's just the things that you can control. That has nothing to do with what happens when there's a pandemic or what happens when there's political upheaval, okay? Or, I mean, a perfect example of this, back to my 2020 being approved text for Life is in the Transitions, is in the language of my book, the pandemic is a global, excuse me, is a collective involuntary life quake. Okay, and if you, as you remember in my book, which was obviously done before the pandemic, that was the smallest category was collective right. involuntary life quake. And now this, and there's like what I call a throwaway line in my book where it's like, oh, if I'd done this a hundred years, you know, hundred years ago with two world wars and reset, you know, depression, we would have all been going through collective experiences. There's actually something kind of charmingly old fashioned amidst the horror and misery and loss and pain and instability of the pandemic that we're all going through it together. There's, that's actually something in a, in a way to mark and to note, but that's a collective involuntary life quake. And when we go back and look at 2020, what is the thing that happens 60 days after the onset of the pandemic? The answer to the protest movement. And what is that? That is a collective voluntary life quake. 
And in the language of my book, that's a pileup and you cannot disconnect them in my view. Because what happens when you get one life quake is that your, your, you know, your, your immune system is weakened. <laughs> and so then along comes, I mean, the George Floyd thing as horrible as it was, was unfortunately not rare. And therefore, you know, there have been many regularly, these kinds of things had been happening. Even earlier that year, they had been happening. Why this one? Because our immune system was weaker, we were cooped up. And because the pandemic was disproportionately affecting black and brown people. And because of systemic racism, many of those people were outside the healthcare system and therefore you know, didn't, weren't taking a simple pill to deal with hypertension and that killed them in higher numbers. So finally people were just like, I had enough. And then they, boom, they go onto the streets. And of course then that has a political backlash to it. So my point is there's all the things that we can in voluntarily change. And then there's all the things that we can involuntarily change and they're all happening. And there's just simply no doubt that the pace of change is much faster than it was in the past. And I can't help but think about the economic pressure that has shifted from the investment in, to exactly your point, the here and the now, the American worker, where they were born and raised, where they went to school, we're going to invest there, we're going to build the factories there, we're going to create jobs there, to a globalization now where it's profit over people. So when my grandfather was joining the factory, they paid for him to go to school because they wanted him to stay there as a worker, highly educated, to be productive, to produce the widgets that went into the cars, et cetera. And now what we've seen with globalization is there's even more instability in these neighborhoods where you could find that dependable education, that dependable job, live the American dream, quote unquote, stay there your entire life, raise a family, it's close to your family. That's been disrupted with us chasing profits and looking for the simplest way to grow shareholder value and not necessarily investing in the people side of the equation. And do you see that swinging back in your research for this next book? What, what do you see going on with obviously this increase in transitions and the upheaval that we're experiencing on the other side as people are left behind by these involuntary transitions? Well, there was one dimension that I didn't say earlier when I was talking about this life shape question, because essentially I was making a formula uh, and I was saying that how we look at the world affects how we look at our life. Agricultural world, cyclical, human life, cyclical. Okay, you know, sort of early modern era, there's more urbanism, there's some, there's a staircase because, you know, they wouldn't have had a staircase in, you know, in, the, in Mesopotamia because there weren't that many staircases, right? So they have a staircase economy, there's a staircase. And then the sign, you know, the industrial revolution, we start to see the world as, as being defined by the factory and the you know, conveyor belt and the, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for with the, uh, everybody working in a line, um, uh, you know, a sort of a, a you know, factory model where one person does something that creates a linear life. Where we are now, what I didn't get to is that we understand that the world, we understand with chaos theory and with network theory, we understand that the world is more webbed and the internet globalization, globalization all these things you're talking about are connected. The defining uh, introduction of the idea of chaos was a paper that was uh, written by a professor in Boston, which basically says that if a butterfly flaps its wings in Latin America, that there's a tornado that happens in, in, in North America, okay? That was, that's famously, of course, called the butterfly effect. So that point is exactly the point that you're just making. A butterfly flaps its wings in, in, in China and somebody in Paris wants a different kind of shoe. And therefore the person making the shoe in whatever Worcester Mass to, to beat this analogy to death um, is out of a job. Um, and so that we are so much more intimately connected. And you're absolutely right that in the 1970s, when the sort of cult of shareholder value cut, cuts in, that universities, um, I mean, that the corporations no longer felt any obligation to their, or they felt less of an obligation to their team members than they do to, um, uh, to their shareholders. And that that's created downsizing, right sizing, you know, all these all these kinds of things. Okay, what's interesting is that we are in a moment right now where that's being blown up by the pandemic because work from home uh, is, I think, going to create a huge amount of change, um, if for no other reason that men 
more men are working from home, more men are interested in flex time, and the kind of core issue, which is that the, it, which is that moms have been disproportionately bur women and moms have been disproportionately burdened <laughs> by uh, inflexibility in the corporation. Guess what? Now dads are dealing with it because they're home too. So I actually think that there's a huge change that's going on because you have more women in the workplace, three quarters of women now working outside the home, but you also have more dads in the parenting space. And as a result, the membranes that used to divide work from family are becoming more porous. And frankly, the pandemic has just blown those to smithereens. So I think that there is going to be a moment of reimagining. I think that the a, a positive, but there's a positive frame to this. Um, uh, in, in like all things, there's pros and cons to this story. And, the, and the, the pro, so I'm not totally kind of just downer here, is that there is more opportunity to write your own work, family, life story than there ever was before, okay? Because if the core relationship that we've been talking about off and on here, the corporation is gonna provide for you, you just have to sacrifice yourself to the corporation. Well, guess what? The corporation no longer feels beholden to you, so you don't have to feel beholden to it. And as a result, it allows people to ask a lot of questions um, that have to do with what do I do in, these, in, in the nodes of the network? What do I do in these moments of instability uh, the life quakes, you know, the work quakes, if you will. What do I do in these moments? Do I want to stay where I am? Do I want to leave and do something else? Do I want to start a side hustle? Do I want to start a podcast, you know, or make a movie in my backyard? That there are other ways to do it, and that increasingly that is done in consultation with the others in your family. So, what does my partner want to do? Okay, well, maybe my partner needs to go back to school. Okay, so my partner needs to go back to school. So therefore I need to spend more time focusing on income right now. And then, okay, my partner will be out and that, and then my partner will have a job and then maybe I can focus more on ourselves. So we need, you know, I've been sort of trying to experiment with what to call this in my mind. My favorite phrase this week is kind of, is sort of like, you know, a whole life career look. So I think that we're gonna to get to a kind of a whole there's the whole 30 diet. We're gonna need like a whole 360 view of our work lives that will take, a, take into consideration our primary work, our secondary work, our creative thing on the side, our spousal work, what's happening with the children. And the advantage is, whereas in the past, if you step off the conveyor belt, you can never get back on. Now you can step off and on and off and on and off and on. So therefore every decision need not be a, life, life, a lifetime decision. It could be a, the next three or four year decision. And it is something that you, you have to mentally, emotionally, and physically set yourself up for because learning new skills, uh, having a growth mindset, having um, perseverance and, and, and to be resilient when certain things don't work out or you're, and you're, you're constantly in the red. And what I mean by that of, of being frustrated of learning new things or always at the level of incompetence because you're, you're growing, you're learning, you're putting yourself into new areas that you, you haven't been before. And that's for a lot of people, it's utterly terrifying. Um, for a lot of people, it's, a, it's, a, you can even make yourself comfortable in, in that realm. And we're, we're seeing that transition play out. And I think that's why we see so many people with anxiety through the roof, uh, who are scared, um, who are looking for certainty and safety wherever they can find it because they're not finding it in their own lives. And I think that's where. And the way we were raised narrative. and taught to find oh. that security. And I think yeah. what, what stood out to me in the book is just how important agency is in this survival toolkit. And you have to take control of that narrative to rewrite it. And I feel many of us, when we find ourselves, especially in a life quake, it is easy to not work on the narrative, to put the blame elsewhere, to feel and fall into the victim mindset. But the book pretty clearly articulates that those who survive and thrive through these transitions, and we all will ultimately, it starts with a level of agency internally to say, you know what, I'm going to rewrite this narrative. I'm going to take control in this situation where I feel like life may be out of control. 
So let me do two things here in responding to those two comments. Let me let me be abstract and we'll do some big think <laughs> to Johnny's question, and then we're going to get to the practical and to your question, um, AJ. Johnny, what I want to say to you is that you said earlier <laughs> that you know your generation or generations today or people today have to accept that they're not they're, that they're not inevitably going to create more wealth or be more well off or do better than uh, their or your parents' generation. So what- We said it was a possibility. Yes. What? I'm sorry, what? What's your clarification? I, I believe I, I, it, was a, it was a possibility, right? Like, yeah, it's so it's not, not guaranteed, it, right? Yeah, obviously it's not some people will and some people will not. Um, but yes, it, it, it's no longer a guaranteed thing that will just naturally happen if you play by the rules and do the right thing and, and you know, and do your homework and, and you know, brush your teeth and, uh, you know, write a thank you note when something nice happens to you. Yes, it's not going to just naturally, inevitably happen from all the things that I tell my children to do on a daily basis. That's, that was that thing I was ticking off in my head. Do your homework, brush your teeth. <laughs> right, thank you. Um, I don't really care about teeth. Her wife, their, their mom cares about teeth. I, I care more about the thank you note than then she cares about the teeth. You, know, you, you got to diversify as a parent. Um, the, but there's, what you're saying is that linearity has turned its back on you. So the question is, are you going to be the spurned lover that's going to be, you know, kind of yearning, pining for the, for the linearity that is already, you know, abandoned you? It's turned its back on you and you need to turn its back, your back on it. Okay, so that's, that, that's, that's part of, of what uh, I'm saying is that we are still haunted by the ghost of linearity, but linearity is not how the world works. And so we have to kind of grow up and realize that we're looking for something that's not there. And we grew up in other areas of our life. And this is just not an area of life that we spend a lot of time talking about, which is what is the shape of your life, right? What is, what can you expect out of life? There was an interesting moment when we were coding this and in which I, I had all these millennial coders and we were, we were dealing with this piece of data in front of us, which is that 53% of people's life quakes were involuntary. Okay, so an involuntary life quake is a downsizing, your spouse cheats on you, you get a diagnosis, your house burns down, okay, 53%. That means 47% were voluntary. So voluntary is you leave an organization to start a new enterprise, you cheat on your spouse, you change your religion, uh, whatever it might be, okay? And so I looked at this and I was like, dang, like 47% of life quakes are voluntary. Like, you know, like fucking A, man, like we're getting it. We are embracing the full opportunity of the nonlinear life. We are seeing something about our life we don't like. And instead of just whining into our beer, we're actually agentically, AJ, we're going off and doing something about this. The kids on my team, I call them kids, but you know, the 20 somethings on my team were like, whoa, 53% are involuntary. Like I can't control my life. Yeah, you can't control your life. You can, therefore, if there's something you control, like one of my life mottos is control what you can control because there's a lot of things that you can't control, okay? So that gets to, so that's my big thing. But now let's just get to the practical because we've been very kind of high-minded here. And let me talk about what do you do when you're in this moment because everybody listening to us is in this moment in one way or the other. There's been this, okay, the first thing that we talked about, the first answer I gave is how this book has been this project that I worked on for half a decade has some way been shaped by arriving in the middle of the pandemic, okay? And so nothing has been, I don't know, disproven by this. If anything, every all the ideas on how to navigate a life transition to me have been reinforced by this, even such a, a simple thing like creativity. People use creativity, right? What's the first thing everybody did when we got into the pandemic? They started to bake. Right? Remember, that was like the number one cliche. Like, we're going to sourdough our way through this. Like, I may have been the only person in America who was not shocked by this because what that is is a little act of creativity, a little act of imagining of rather than sitting around or being scared or whining or being in a fetal position under the blanket, I'm going to do something today. I'm going to imagine that I can put my hands in some flour and starter and, and baking soda, salt and butter or whatever it is. And then there's going to be something to eat at the end of the day. And that little act of being able to imagine rebuilding you know, a meal, a loaf of bread, a cupcake is what allows me to imagine that I'm going to be able to get through this. And it's these little acts of creativity that help us recreate ourselves. 
but some ideas have become stronger. And there's an idea in my book that I liked, but that has become a kind of a big, a big flashing kind of, I don't know, green light in the middle of the pandemic. And that idea is, addresses your point, AJ. And that is that the life quake can be voluntary or involuntary, but the life transition must be voluntary. You have to choose to lean in and go through the steps, okay? And so now there tend to be two types of people when they get hit by a life quake. Some people make a 217 item to-do list and are like, I'm gonna do it this weekend and I'm gonna be the gold medal and I'm gonna be the greatest person who ever you know, got over you know, uh, being fired or whatever it might be. And then other people, which is kind of more people, but other people, um, one of my favorite lines is there's two types of people in the world, people who divide the world into two types of people and people who don't. Um, anyway, so the other type of people are people who are like, I'm in quicksand, I'm in a fetal position, I'm never gonna get through this, okay? I'm here to say kind of like both of you are wrong, right? Because if you look at enough of these, there are certain patterns. So life transitions have three phases, okay? You know, there's the long goodbye where you are kind of saying goodbye and mourning the you that's not coming back. There's the messy middle where you're shedding habits and back to creativity, creating new ones. And there are these new beginnings. You know this, of course, because it's the backbone of my book, but, I, I, but I'm bringing that up to say, even learning that is incredibly reassuring because everybody turns out to be good at one phase and bad at another. So that list maker, the 217 item to-do list, and if I had to guess, probably one of you falls into that category. Um, that person is, okay, okay, Johnny is taking himself out of consideration. I don't know about you, um, AJ, um, but that person's good at the messy middle. <laughs> because they're gonna to do your, you're gonna have, this is what I'm gonna share and this is what I'm gonna create, I'm gonna get through it. That person is probably less good at confronting the emotion because that person is probably in denial that this is an emotional experience and that they're feeling fear or sadness or shame, which are the top emotions people feel. Ironically, the person in a fetal position is probably good at dealing with the emotion. They're probably good at the long goodbye because they are feeling the weight of the emotional, um, exercise, heavy lifting that's going to have to be done to say goodbye to the past. Um, and then when they get to the messy middle, you know, it's going to be different for them. So the point is everybody, and, and, and I'm all fine for that. I mean, the, the, one of the things that makes me grumpy about the way people used to talk about life transitions, you know, as you know, there hasn't really been a major book on this in 40 years, is it was like, you have to go through these steps in order. First, you have to say goodbye, and then you have to be in the betwixt and between, and then you have to that's just bullshit. That's just not how people live. And um, because you say goodbye and then you go to the new beginning, and then you forgot something, and, you know, there's something in the old room, you got to go back there and, you know, or again, this is not your generation, but if you, are, if you are divorced and you're raising children, even if you're remarried, you're still parenting with the old, you know, the old partner. They're, these things are done in an, everybody does them in an idiosyncratic fingerprint, their own fingerprint kind of way. But, but my point is, so whatever you're dealing with now, whatever kept you awake last night, whatever you got up this morning and made a cup of coffee and stared out the window, or in your case, Johnny, you know, got a guitar and just strummed and played, whatever it is that you're worrying about, um, pick one of the things and say, that's the transition I'm gonna go through because you can't go through seven at once. So pick one, pick a phase you're good at, start there, let's build some confidence. And kind of my main message here is that life gets you stuck and a transition is what gets you unstuck. And there are tools, there are phases, there are things you can do to make it go more effectively. And I think that example of the, the baking we all resonated with because there is an end. The bread comes out of the oven. We know that there's a payoff at the end and, and we have it timed out. And for many of us, when the pandemic hit, and it felt like this is just dragging on and we have no idea when it's going to end. And that uncertainty led us to acts of certainty, even in our creativity, taking up yes. baking, That's learning so something. Yes. And the, the book highlights that there is certainty in all of these phases. We just may not see it in the moment. So you are going to go through these phases and, and that goodbye is going to end and the messy middle is going to start and it's also going to end and you will make your way through. And I, I think that's a, a pretty powerful reminder that no matter how uncertain and of course with the multiple transitions hitting at once in these life quakes that every one of those phases ends in that transition it's not for the rest of your life and it may feel 
like it's unending while you're in it. But the lessons through the book are, yeah, these transitions lead to growth. 90% of the people that I spoke to said that the transition came to an end. To me, before the, before the pandemic, this was the signature piece of data of this project, which is that I asked 225 people, how long did it take? And the number one, that the most common answer and the average answer was five years. Okay. That, you know, on the one hand, I have kind of been downplaying it in the pandemic because everyone feels like they're in a transition and you don't exactly want to be the person that says, congratulations, you'll get through it, but it'll take you five years. <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, having said that, if you actually step back and look at this, you're going to have three to five of these in a lifetime. They're going to take four or five, six years. That's 25 years. That's half of our adult lives we're spending in transition. And so that's why this book is called Life is in the Transitions, which is a William James phrase, as you know, from a century ago. Because if we just look at these times as periods that we have to grit or grind or grovel or grunt our way through, we are missing half of our lives. Okay. And you can look at the great stories from scripture. Abraham leaving his father's house, the Israelites going into the desert, Jesus going out to the, you know, go, going into the desert, Paul on the road to Damascus, the Buddha going out, you know, Muhammad going out and back and forth between Mecca and Medina. They all have these periods. If you look at the great myths, Odysseus, Orpheus, Jason, Hercules, these all have these periods, the same novels. There's a reason these stories are still told thousands of years later. And it's the same thing with the fairy tales, okay? We all want to be, let's go back to the fairy tale thing, because that was what we were talking about earlier with the storytelling, because it's so important to me. We want to be the hero. We want the happy ending, but we don't want the wolf. We don't want to go through the woods, <laughs> okay? And But we know that the wolf is going to appear. And it could be an ogre, it could be a dragon, as I said earlier, it could be a tornado, a pandemic, <laughs> a downsizing. And you can't banish the wolf because if you banish the wolf, you banish the hero. And if there's one thing I learned is that we all want to be and need to be the hero of our own story. And that's what this is about. When you end up in the woods, you're the hero. I remember reading a, I remember reading a Wrinkle in Time to my 10 year olds. And I don't know if you remember the part of this that's important to me, which is that the father, I'm the dad, I'm the dad reading this, okay? The dad is disappears. The dad is, you know, multiple uh, whatever planets or realms away. And the girl, Meg, goes after, you know, bouncing from place to place. And then she finally gets to the dad. And I, and I remember this. I, I, I had never, I never read this book as a kid. One of the pleasures of having daughters was I got to read the canon of girl lit um, that I had never read. Like I think it was in Brooklyn, like the closest thing to a perfect book I've ever read. Um, anyway, I don't even know what's gonna happen in the story. And I remember closing the book at whatever it was, half an hour past bedtime and saying, what's gonna happen now? Girls, what is gonna happen now in the story? Who's gonna save the day? And of course, what are they gonna say? Because they're 10 year old girls. They're 15, they don't say the same word. Like the dad's gonna save the day. I'm like, no, the dad is not gonna save the day. She's gonna save the day. That's why we're reading this book 50 years later. The only reason, and I don't even know what's gonna happen, but I know that she is gonna have to do it. She wants the dad to save her, but she's gonna have to do it. That's your agency, okay? You're gonna have to rewrite the story. You're gonna have to be the hero of your own story. I love that. And it's such a great way to finish this wonderful chat. I know that many of us going through this involuntary transition that has created a life quake in all of our lives uh, need to be reminded of that exact thing, that we will get through it. And part of that narrative is you taking the agency and crafting it in a meaningful way for yourself personally to get through it. And it's going to be different for every one of us, but the themes in the book and the, the fact that data was involved. It's not just one or two stories, but looking across 50 states and with all these interviews, the patterns are the same. And if we can master the patterns, we can get through a life in transition. We can get through this together. And so my promise to you is whatever you're going through, you come on this journey with me and meet these people, you're, you're going to get hope for sure, but you're going to get actually practical things you can do tonight or next week, the week after uh, to make whatever transition you're in go a little bit better. 
and a lot more effectively. We can we can beat both. We can beat back the wolves together, everybody. Well, we love ending our episode with a challenge for the audience, something practical that they can do in the next week to make a difference, to make a change or an improvement. And I know the book has multiple opportunities for that. Is there one challenge that stands out for you, for our audience, that would be beneficial as they experience this transition? Oh, well, I'll double down. I'll go with two, one backward looking and one forward. So number one would be to ask yourself, what's the biggest emotion you're struggling with right now? Think about it, articulate it, tell somebody about it, write it down if that's helpful to you, but accept that this is an emotional experience and don't try to hide from that. And because we're talking about it, then think of something. So that's sort of like part of the, the long goodbye, but then part of the messy middle and part of creating the new you is to pick something. Maybe, maybe the challenge, I'll, I'll be specific about it. Pick something that you used to love doing. Okay, maybe it's playing music, maybe it's tap dancing. Okay, you know, maybe it's baking, maybe it's singing, maybe it's, you know, whatever it is, something that you, some part of your personality that you stuck away in the back of the closet, push away the dirty laundry, pull up the old shoes, you know, open the cardboard box and whatever is in that cardboard box, play with that for a while. I that'll love help that. you. That'll help whatever, whatever you're going to make that comes out of that box is going to help you make yourself anew. Thank you so much for joining us, Bruce. Fantastic conversation and a wonderful book. My pleasure. See you guys down the road. Thank you.